Good morning, everybody. My name is Aaron Kimball. And I'm Theron Raby. And today, we're going to talk to you about Codon, a system that we built at Zymergen in order to help our scientific staff design experiments involving large co collections of genetic engineering experiments. Uh, this talk is divided into five parts. First, we're going to talk about what it is that we do at Zymergen. And then I'm going to give you a brief biology lesson. Um, this is going to help explain some of the key terminology that we need in order to uh, understand the rest of this talk and the motivation for some of the specific challenges that we face. Uh, then we're going to talk specifically about how the problem of microbiology experimentation uh, affects us in software engineering at Zymergen, talk about the solution we delivered, and then evaluate it to understand how well it did and uh, what we could do better in a future version. So let's start with what it is that we exactly do at Zymergen. Zymergen is in the industrial fermentation industry. We make microbes that make chemicals. Uh, if you saw the previous talk on biomaterials, you might have uh, seen uh, some aspects of this uh, shown at. Industrial fermentation is a technology that allows microorganisms like yeast or bacteria to uh, ferment sugar into a wide variety of chemicals uh, for any number of purposes. Some medicines like penicillin are industrially fermented. Agricultural products like fertilizers, pesticides, animal nutrition products, or uh, chemicals that apply more towards the industrial sector like bioplastic. Microbes can also be used in more exotic contexts. For example, the, some microbes can break down plastic. So there can be these cycles where microbes manufacture plastic out of sugar and then uh, break it down on the other side for waste management purposes. Of course, if you want this to happen, that means that you have to induce a microbe to actually produce the chemical you want. And this is a very complicated problem because the way that you control a microbe or any organism, it's through its DNA. And DNA is a very large search space. If you think about what's considered a hard problem in uh, AI or machine learning, such as playing games like chess or Go, these involve uh, computing on the order of uh, 10 to the 100 to 10 to the 300 possible moves uh, that, that need to be evaluated or, or pruned against. In biology, we have so many orders of magnitude more uh, of, of free space to work with. If you think about a genome at just the gene level, uh, where it's large blocks uh, of DNA that you are manipulating, you have between 10 to the 5,000 and 10 to the 25,000 uh, different opportunities at play, depending on the complexity of the organism. And then if you look at the DNA at the base pair level, the individual AGCTs uh, in the string, uh, we're talking 4 to the 3 million to 4 to the 3 billion uh, possible changes that could be performed. So this is a problem that requires uh, that we uh, focus very effectively if we're going to actually find needles in this haystack uh, that are going to make changes that help the organism do the things that we want to do. At Zymergen, we have two pieces of technology that help us perform this search more effectively uh, than other organizations that have come before. First, we exclusively use robot automation to manufacture and test genomes within microbes. Uh, a lot of organizations create microbes or create genetic changes by hand using pipettes. And this allows a human scientist to test on the order of, say, uh, a dozen theories per month. We can perform 100 to 1,000 uh, engineering experiments per cycle, and we can start cycles very frequently. So this allows us to have broader coverage of the search space. We also use what we call an atheoretic approach. We are less concerned with the particular mechanism of action by which a given uh, genetic change actually causes the change in the phenotype or the trait, and we're more concerned with the fact that it simply works. And so we run a search algorithm effectively by scanning the genome, finding areas where there seems to be uh, a mechanistic link, and then we optimize in that area to get the best possible uh, linkage outcome for uh, the goal of our experiment. And so by using machine learning and these kinds of tools to guide our experimentation process, this allows for the design of hundreds or thousands of different genomes at a time, which we can then plug into our robotic experimentation system or our factory. So now let's go one level deeper and understand just a little bit about the biology uh, that motivates how these kinds of experiments work. And for anybody in the audience who actually knows biology, I apologize, I am a computer scientist. And this is a very high-level overview that is just uh, intended to introduce the key terms in a simple way. So I mentioned that Zymergen performs industrial fermentation experiments. Industrial fermentation works very similarly to the fermentation that you all know and love that makes beer and wine. 
You take a large vessel, fill it with water, add some yeast or a different microorganism, add some sugar for fuel, and then wait a while. In beer fermentation, the yeast will consume the sugar and emit alcohol as well as perhaps other uh, trace compounds that add to a unique flavor profile. And in industrial fermentation, uh, it's producing a chemical that maybe isn't alcohol. And we can produce, as I said earlier, hundreds of different chemicals depending on the particular metabolism of the microorganism in question. One key difference between uh, beer fermentation and industrial fermentation is the scale at which this operates. Uh, if you're making a home brew situation, you are perhaps working in five to 50 gallons of beer at a time, and an industrial brewer might produce a vat of 5,000 gallons at a time. Industrial fermentation uh, of chemicals operates at the 100,000 gallon scale or above. So we are talking about absolutely uh, massive fermenters. And at that point, the economics of what you're making are very important. A lot of these chemicals are pure commodities, which means that they're sold uh, with relatively low margins. So there are some economic factors about the microbe that have to be true beyond simply making some quantity of the chemical you care about. First, you have to convert a high percentage of the sugar into the target chemical and produce as little waste chemicals or other chemicals as possible because that's wasted input and you're going to have to then spend more effort separating those chemicals out the other side. The microbe also needs to have a healthy appetite. You want it to digest sugar hungrily and with continuous throughput as opposed to sort of nibbling at the feedstock. And finally, we would like the microbe to survive in a high concentration of the output chemical. Beer fermentation switches off between 5 and 10 percent because the microbes effectively poison themselves with the alcohol. They can't tolerate a high alcohol environment. So the more of your output chemical concentration that uh, your microbe can tolerate, the longer you can let a fermentation process run before you have to flush out the tank and sort of refill it and start all over again, which takes time. So successful industrial fermentation projects require convincing the microbe to make the chemical you care about and then successively optimizing these phenotypes or traits until it reaches the economic performance levels that you need. And so this involves a process that we call microbial engineering. In microbial engineering, uh, we have many successive rounds of directed evolution. We start with some best current microbe, and then we manufacture a collection of child microbes that each have uh, one or more small genetic changes uh, in various locations that we hope will cause a change in the phenotypes of interest. And there's a number of different techniques that we can use to manufacture these kinds of changes. First, we could, man we could mutate a single base pair. This is called a single nucleotide polymorphism, or a SNP. And changing a single A to a T or a single G to a C can sometimes have uh, outsized effects on the actual observed behavior of the organism. We could also perform more radical changes by changing larger sections of the genome, such as some of the regulatory machinery of the genome that is uh, not the genes. We can swap in and out different sections there. And we could also remove a gene entirely. Doing so is called creating a knockout organism, and so this can be used to shut off a behavior that we don't want, like manufacturing some other chemical uh, as a waste product. And finally, we can insert one or more genes at a time. Uh, this can involve a very large insert of uh, you know, five or 10,000 bases at a time or more, and this will perform a more radical change by basically installing a feature in a microbe. So frequently, this last technique is the one you use first. You sort of install the genes that manufacture uh, the chemical you want, and then successive rounds of evolution work on controlling the rest of the genome to improve its performance. All of this is done in a three-step manufacturing process. First, we build short snippets of DNA that are going to perform the change. Then we build the microbe by introducing that DNA into the microbe and letting the change happen. And then we want to test the microbe. We want to actually see if this uh, does what we think it will do. So, Here's a, a very high-level, simplified version of how we perform these three steps. Uh, it, the first step is building the DNA. So for this example, let's think about creating a SNP where we change the G above that arrow into a C below that arrow, which is highlighted in red. So we're going to create a bunch of DNA parts. The first of these parts is the actual change cassette that we want to insert, which in this case is just the letter C. Then we need to create what are called homology arms. Homology arms are regions that are to the left and to the right of the insert uh, that match exactly the DNA of the underlying organism. Uh, 
The homology arms in a real experiment would be between 25 and 100 bases long, and it's actually a software optimization problem to find optimal length homology arms that meet uh, criteria for certain process conditions that are encountered when performing the change. Then we concatenate these homology arms and the insertion uh, together, along with another uh, piece of DNA that is not particular to this one genetic change called the backbone. The backbone is sort of a carrier that's going to deliver this insertion payload into the cell, and the rest of it is looped onto the backbone on both sides. This is single-stranded DNA, not the double helix that uh, you think about perhaps in sort of uh, a classic biology textbook picture. And this circular DNA, this a single-stranded piece of DNA is going to turn into a circle and loop at both ends where there's no well-defined start or end point. Uh, and this is an item that we call a plasmid. The key takeaway is that in addition to creating the particular piece of DNA we want to insert, we also create other pieces of DNA in this process that are necessary to perform the mechanistic action of the insertion. And these are particular to the experiment. So then in the second step, building the microbe, we insert the plasmid into the cell. So at the bottom of the screen, we could see a cell with, in blue, our main uh, DNA genome uh, floating around in there, and our plasmid is also floating around in there. And I've helpfully aligned for illustrative purposes the, the, the homology regions of the plasmid are, are directly on top of the same regions within the cell's own genome. As the cell begins to replicate, a protein is going to move along the DNA strand to uh, produce another copy of this DNA. But because the homology regions of our uh, insertion uh, match the DNA exactly, it's possible for this protein to sort of skip onto our plasmid. Uh, this is something called crossover. And so then when we finish replicating the genome, the replicated genome might have traveled along that uh, plasmid path, and now we have our new change uh, in place of the original DNA that was in that location. The G has changed into a C in the second cell. We can then cultivate a colony of these cells and move them into the test process. In the test process, we perform industrial fermentation uh, by either taking at small scale something called a plate, uh, which is about a uh, index card sized piece of plastic with 96 small wells in it that can be filled with liquid, uh, or we can work in a larger bioreactor, which is the vessel shown on the right. Bioreactors are anywhere from a liter to five gallons, and they offer a more precise test uh, but they are slower and more expensive to run, and they take up more bench space, so you can't run as many distinct uh, microbe variants in bioreactors. And the basic process is the same in either. We put uh, sugar and water into the cell, into the well, along with the cells, and then after a predefined period of time, we measure the concentration of the output chemical and compare it to our benchmark strain to see if we've beaten the benchmark. And then whichever's the best cell from here, we then take and bring into the next round of genetic engineering. So given this context that Aaron described of a factory scale wet lab, which we call simply the factory, and an atheoretic approach to using it, we like to think of our experiments as these search spaces of DNA designs. Our factory then can directedly explore those search spaces, looking for certain optimized phenotypes as it goes in a high throughput parallel fashion. This, however, leaves us with a bit of a shortcoming in the existing tools for designing DNA. Uh, most of these existing tools really focus on building single designs at a time, uh, search spaces of size one, if you will. This problem kind of it reinforces the idea that a scientist will be making a single hypothesis at a time and then testing it with that one change, and then going back and trying again. Uh, so we have a need to overcome this and design very large search spaces in very little time and space. So this talk will now kind of shift to how we solved this problem. That problem, more concisely put, is how do we direct the factory to perform the work necessary to carry out some abstract experiment design? Well, in claiming that we can do this, there are kind of three implications that go along with that. We, we can break this problem into saying, well, for one, there must be some way that we can take this very abstract notion of an experiment and put it into some data type. Uh, this is a claim in itself because our experiments are potentially very complex. 
Uh, they potentially vary quite a bit from one experiment to the next. And any given experiment, uh, it might change a lot in the future. We don't necessarily know what the logic behind some next experiment might be. Two, there's a, a language that scientists use to describe their experiments to one another. There must be some way to take that language and turn it into that data type that represents the experiment formally. And third, given this data type and a means of turning experiments into that type, there must be some way that we can direct the factory to explore any search space of that type. So for this problem in three parts, we have a solution in three parts, made up of a core data model, a tool we call Codon, and a tool we call Helix. They come together under a common approach of thinking of this microbiology jargon that scientists use to communicate to each other as if it is a programming language. And that programming language's uh, target platform is our factory. So in much the same way that the programming languages you're accustomed to turn your abstract ideas for computations into instructions for a CPU, we can do the same thing by turning these microbiology terms into instructions for the factory. So for part one of those three problems, uh, we have a collection of core data models that look very similar to an abstract syntax tree from a programming language. To turn that microbiology speak into that data model, we have a tool called Codon, which is a domain-specific language that parses and partially evaluates that language into that data model. And third is Helix, which is a tool that, in much the same way a programming language evaluates its ASTs, takes our experiments and evaluates them into instructions for our factory. Looking at our DNA data model, uh, so this is what is ultimately the output of our codon tool, we have two primary types we're looking at. The first and simpler of which is a DNA component, which represents simply a DNA sequence and some information about that sequence. Our second is what we call a DNA specification, which represents a search space over those DNA components. Something good to understand about DNA itself is that we actually, for the most part, don't have any clue about what most of it means. Given any sequence of A's, C's, T's, and G's here, there might be a long sequence of base pairs that we don't know anything about until we get to just that little bit that we think, all right, we have a pretty good idea of what this does. So for those regions, we label them with annotations. So an example here in green, we might say, well, this region of the DNA is what we call a promoter. It basically controls the thing that comes after it, like a volume knob. And in blue, we have a gene. Since these are generally pretty sparse between each other, we often represent them as a solid line with colored boxes strung along it to just kind of show, hey, these are the parts we know. Um, the rest of it, don't worry so much about. Each of these annotations has a type to kind of tell us this is what it's what we think it does. It has a name and perhaps some other static properties around it as well. So a DNA component then is this uh, idea of a single sequence of DNA along with all of the annotations we have for that sequence. Uh, we have our DNA components compatible with kind of the, the common formats for storing DNA, GenBank and SBAL, for example. And DNA specifications, then, are the search spaces over those DNA components. They model these search spaces, like I said earlier, in much the same way that an abstract syntax tree is modeled in your programming language. We start with sets of DNA components, small search spaces, and we connect them into bigger search spaces as nested trees of functions. Uh, some examples might be concatenate, which much like a string concatenation, takes two sequences of DNA and sticks them together. Uh, they can hold other static properties, much like the DNA components as well. To give you a more uh, kind of end-to-end -end view of this data model, 
we can start with a DNA component here. It has a couple annotations that we find interesting. That DNA component might be combined with a few other DNA components into a set of DNA components, which is in itself a very small search space. Of course, if we asked our scientists to actually list every DNA sequence in a search space, we would be turning our scientists into data entry. Um, so what we want to do is represent these very large sets as functions over smaller sets. And that's how we use a DNA specification. So this DNA specification has two small sets, and it connects them by concatenation, saying we have a large search space that is made up of all the concatenations of these two smaller search spaces. Actually creating a DNA specification data structure by hand uh, would be a complicated challenge for uh, programmers to do. There's a lot of tedium involved in setting all the different properties as well as constructing uh, all of the nested structures within these objects. So we want a convenient mechanism to allow people to encode these DNA specifications and that's where the codon language comes in. Codon is a domain specific language we implemented in Scala for parsing and partially evaluating biologist lingo into DNA specifications. It is a procedural syntax, so more complicated search spaces or more complicated expressions are built up hierarchically out of simpler search space expressions that came before it. The function library in Codon is tailored to the language that biologists use, and it has a wide range of abstraction. At the one extreme, you can use Codon to describe creating a knockout or performing other annotation level uh, changes to the underlying DNA in the sets. And at the other end, we can treat DNA like a string sequence and perform SNP changes and other uh, manipulations of the DNA directly. So this allows for a great degree of flexibility in the kinds of experiments that can be described with the language. A key goal between Codon and the next tool, Helix, that comes after it is separating the what to do of an experiment from the how to do it. So in Codon, scientists describe the target DNA sequences they want to manufacture. And the next tool then calculates what does the factory need in terms of DNA parts to actually perform that manufacturing operation. To give a motivating example of how codon works, uh, let's talk about a kind of change called promoter swapping. As Theron mentioned, a promoter is kind of a volume knob that changes the expression level of the gene that follows it. So a weaker or a stronger promoter can have a weaker or stronger uh, phenotype uh, response from a particular gene. So here on our DNA sequence, we've got two genes of interest, YFG1 and 2. Uh, your favorite gene here is what that stands for. And uh, there are promoters ahead of each of these genes and something else called a terminator that follows it. So in our experiment, suppose we had a library of three promoters of known calibrated strength. We might want to try each of these promoters in front of these collection of genes of interest. So here we can run a compound exp uh, expression where first, within a host strain, we locate the genes that match the expression YFG star with their name. And we also have a promoter library held in the variable promoters. And we can run the replace promoter function uh, on the located genes with these promoters, which will give us a combinatorial set uh, of all possible combinations of these promoters and genes. Uh, the X in brackets next to the word replace promoter means that we should be doing this in a cross product format. So for each promoter and for each gene, generate an output. There's also a dot product mode where the sets have to be the same size and they evaluate pairwise. So here we can see in our example outputs, four of six possible outputs are shown, and each of P1 through P3 prime are ahead of YFG1 in the first three versions, where YFG2 is held constant. And then in the fourth example, P1 prime starts moving in front of YFG2, and the original promoter is left in front of YFG1. So now uh, we have, in a linear way, expressed a, quad a quadratic size search space, uh, which is a, a more compact representation and more flexible. So downstream from this codon tool, we need a tool that takes in those DNA specifications and makes sense of what to do with them. Uh, we call this tool Helix. And in much the same way some programming language might evaluate its AST, we use term rewriting as an abstract semantics framework for evaluating, in a sense, these DNA specifications to create the, uh, both the 
entire search space we need, as well as evaluating under some different contexts, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, just a quick review on term rewriting. It's, it's pretty intuitive. You probably use it all the time without really thinking about it. You learned it in algebra class with maybe an expression like x equals 1 times 2 plus 3 times 4. Uh, we can search for terms within that greater term and rewrite them in a sim as simpler terms. So for instance, if we uh, look at 1 times 2, well, we can change that into just 2. As we progressively go through this term, rewriting it, eventually we end up with x equals 14, which is equivalent to the original expression, but much simpler to work with. The way your programming language might model this is much like DNA specifications as a tree of functions with the operands as the leaves. So for our expression here, we end up with a tree that looks like this. And to perform that rewrite, we can traverse down this tree looking for, at the bottom, we have 1 and 2 as op the first operands we might traverse to. Those can't be rewritten. They're very simple. But the node above them, that multiplication, can easily be written as 2. Doing the same thing on the right side, we have 2 plus 12 and eventually 14. So we can look at our DNA specifications under much the same light. We have a nested tree of functions, in this case, two concatenations. At the leaves, we have not just simple operands, but sets of DNA components. As we traverse down this tree, we reach the nested concatenation, which we can rewrite as this larger search space. And again, at the top level, we now have a fully reified search space, despite no scientist ever having to actually list all those out. It's a little bit more complicated than that, though. So as Aaron described earlier, concatenating DNA isn't as simple as just saying, well, these are the sequences, let's stick them together. We need these homology arms. So in this sense, there's another context of evaluation. And this is what we gain from uh, viewing this as an abstract term rewriting system, is we can implement these new contexts reusing most of our code. So we might traverse down the tree as usual, but under this green context, we're not simply applying that concatenation function. We need to apply a function of that function, basically, that spits out the homology arms that we need for that particular operation to actually take place in the factory. So here, we can emit the homology arms, perform our usual rewrite, as in the evaluation step, come back up to the top, do the same thing, and in the end, we're left with both a fully reified search space and under any number of other contexts, for example, homology arm calculation, we can have the full set of all of those evaluated contexts. So at this point, we've kind of shown you from beginning to end a high overview of how this whole system works. And we kind of like to shift the talk now to maybe what we could have done better and lessons we learned along the way. So how does this, how does this tool work? Uh, First, Codon is an effective tool for our scientists. They use it every day to create new collections of experiments to run. And uh, I haven't actually tallied up how many strains have been designed through this tool, but uh, it's certainly well above the tens of thousands. So while it is a tool that achieves its direct objective, it's not without its own problems. And we've learned a number of lessons which are not just particular to Codon, but we think are hopefully helpful advice to help you from uh, falling into some of the same mistakes. The unfortunate conclusion for the language buffs and the audience who came to see this talk is that creating our own DSL may have been overkill. Uh, the core feature that is really important of Codon is the library of functions that operate in terms that biologists understand. And creating our own syntax around that was intended to solve other problems, but again, created more problems of its own, and perhaps a library was more effective. So what exactly are these problems that we encountered? The first one of these is a problem of code trust. Search spaces are complicated, and we can't predict what search spaces scientists will dream up in the future. So we need a sort of general purpose mechanism for them to express them, thus code. But we don't actually want scientists to paste Python code into our uh, limbs and then call it with eval, because that would be crazy. So our system needs to safely handle user-specified code somehow. So this is one of the main motivations for the sandboxed code on runtime. We've got our own syntax that we can then 
completely control the sort of VM where that code gets executed. Our VM also has uh, other uh, language features that make it safe. For example, strict static typing, uh, strong normalization, so there's no unbounded while loops, uh, as well as transactionality. So if the codon script has an error in it, we don't commit half of a search space uh, into our limbs. Instead, uh, the scientist simply gets the error message and nothing gets committed. Uh, or if it runs successfully, a whole search space is created at once. Our language also did not allow user-defined functions, uh, which is its own sort of uh, half pro and half con. But the main lesson here is that if you take a step back, we're sort of solving two problems uh, with, with one solution. We have a problem of how do we do the work, how do we empower the scientists to create these search spaces, and then there's another problem of how does this solution stay safe in the context uh, of a shared user environment. And there are good tools for accomplishing each of these distinct tasks separately. For example, on the safety front, we could have invested more effort into DevOps up front and offered users either sandboxed virtual machines that were personal or Docker environments or some other isolated context. And then within there, you know, allowed them to use a different programming language. There are a few tools out there that will actually successfully solve both of these problems. Google's App Engine is sort of its, uh, a specific example where this did happen, but they effectively rewrote the Python runtime entirely in order to facilitate this, which is a larger undertaking than we can do. So the main lesson for this is take a step back and think about uh, not just what your total problem is, but how to decompose it into parts, and then try to develop tools only to solve the most narrow problems associated with your use case. The next problem we ran into is what we've called the simplified interface problem. This comes up because DNA specifications are kind of complex, and we have downstream systems from them that really don't need to care about that complexity. So we thought a nice way to kind of simplify the DNA specification at that code boundary is to make it pretend to be a lazily generated list that can generate each element of its entire search space as desired. Uh, so in a local scope, a private scope, uh, DNA specifications are treated as these trees of functions like I explained but to the public scope, it looks like it's just uh, a list that, like I said, is just kind of created on demand. This brought some problems with it, though. Uh, so at the time this, was, this solution was decided on, all of the functions we were supporting were functions like concatenate, where uh, given two input sets, any combination of elements from those sets could one by one be iteratively performed, but eventually not all functions fit that type. So kind of the, the lesson we learned here is if your business logic is so complex, unpredictable, and varied from, in our case, one experiment to the next, that functions themselves have become a citizen of your data model, be really careful about limiting the types of functions that can be there, because any limitations you claim over the types of those functions are likely to be implicitly or even accidentally encoded into the downstream systems. Uh, so in our case, we turned a, a tree, a rich structure, into a flat list. We lost structural information, thus limiting the types of our functions, and we would have been better off just not losing that structural information at a code boundary. Another problem that came with creating a scripting language is a learning curve problem. Some users really don't want to learn a new scripting language. Our scientific staff ranges in, by, in software expertise from people who really dive in and do a lot of work in Python and R and other languages, and then other scientists who uh, tend to shy much more away from that and prefer to use GUI tools, for example. So even though we've created a perfectly useful user guide that all of them read very thoroughly, um, <laughs> There were still some challenges getting adoption in certain corners. So we created what we called the Codon Cookbook, uh, which was a wiki page with short template scripts that would accomplish the dozen most common genetic engineering tasks and set up experiments like they want for, for these kinds of tasks. And these cookbook scripts ha uh, had some variables at the top that you could sort of switch in and out some parameters uh, to accomplish what you wanted. Even this, however, wasn't necessarily user-friendly enough uh, for certain use cases, especially once experiments got even a little bit more complicated than what the cookbook could accomplish. And so we wound up adding uh, retooling functions that could parse in CSVs into a codon script 
uh, and then process it to generate the search space. Uh, however, you can imagine that um, the CSV functions and the manipulations and data that you could perform in our new language were not necessarily as rich as those you could perform uh, in a more general purpose language. And so the lesson that we took away from this is that it gets really clumsy to provide retooling within your own system. Uh, empowering users to do retooling sort of outside the scope of the system you develop uh, makes this much easier. For example, existing programming languages allow you to combine sort of arbitrarily many libraries to accomplish your solution. So if your DSL needs its own utility libraries, perhaps reconsider the approach that you're taking. Dual to this learning curve problem is what we call the super user problem. Um, so on one end of the spectrum, we have users who don't really, uh, haven't taken the time to really dive into the depths of what to learn. But on the other end, we have users who have learned it so well that they can help out the other users. So in this case, we had one super user who wrote a single codon script that was a generalization of every possible codon script. <laughs> it takes CSV inputs, of course, but nobody wants to write out CSVs full of data, so they wrote Python functions for generating those CSV inputs. This leaves us overall with a comically long mechanism of machines that begins in Python, outputs a CSV file, which goes into a codon template script, which together go into the codon runtime, producing a DNA specification that then is evaluated in Helix, which by the way is implemented in Python. Um, we've effectively <laughs> built a Rube Goldberg machine. <laughs> the solution we suppose might be best at this point is to actually retire codon in favor of a Python library. Some lessons from this that I think are pretty valuable are, if you create a language, users will learn to abuse it as quickly as they learn to use it. And that's not a bad thing in itself. That is something that, rather than trying to avoid, you should just accept and prepare for. We learned that great parts don't necessarily combine into great machines. Every step of that, um, that comical Rube Goldberg machine itself seems really good, but when you chain it end to end, it, it doesn't quite make sense as a unified system. So overall, if you're thinking of approaching your problem as a domain-specific language, it might be a good idea to first implement it as a library in some subset of a well-known general purpose language, work out all the kinks over time, and eventually, if you still need a custom syntax over it, just add a thin layer of syntax rather than uh, giving it its whole own runtime as a language from the get-go. So for conclusions from this whole talk, uh, we built Codon, it's a DSL, for specifying and designing new organisms. Overall, this idea of treating microbiology as if it is a formal language actually appears quite tractable and rather effective from the level of abstract syntax tree down to our factory. However, just because we're using abstract syntax trees as our data model doesn't necessarily imply that we should treat the syntax itself and the way it's, that syntax is turned into our data model as if that itself is a language. So overall, we've learned a lot of lessons from this Codon project, and hopefully this has been a chance for us to share those out with you. Once Thanks again, for, thanks for coming. Oh. <laughs>